This morning, I'd like to begin today's sermon with an episode from the cartoon, Peanuts, like last Sunday. The main character, Lucy, speaks to her brother. She says, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anyone before. Do you see that hill over there? I'm going over the hill I, and find answer to my dreams. Someday, I'm going over that hill and find happiness and fulfillment. I think for me, all the answers to life lie beyond those clouds and over the grass slopes of the hill. Her brother responds, pointing towards the hill. Perhaps there is another little kid on the other side of the hill who is looking this way and thinking that all the answers to life lie on this side of the hill. <coughs> Lucy looks at her brother shortly, then turns towards the hill and shouts, Forget it, kid! In today's scripture reading, Isaiah describes beautifully what it is like on the other side of the hill. And every Advent season, we stand here. There, even the desert will bloom with abundant flowers. Jesus came to build that kind of the world. And, but John the Baptist was not sure. So he sent his disciples to Jesus with the question. Are you the one? Or should we wait for another one? You know what? When the baptized, when he baptized Jesus, he was sure that Jesus was the Messiah he was waiting for. Yet in today's gospel lesson, why should he ask Jesus, are you the one? I guess that John the Baptist was a Palestinian Jew whose homeland was occupied by the Roman Empire. And I think I can understand him. When the Korean War broke out, and almost all South Korean territory was occupied by North Korea and all the Soviet Union armies, all the people of South Korea longed for the Allied forces to arrive at the Korean Peninsula to save them. And finally, the Allied forces led by General MacArthur arrived at Incheon Harbor. At the time, People must have thought that General MacArthur was their Messiah. Jesus has always been misunderstood by many people, even by his disciples. He was never understood by, even by his own disciples until after his death and resurrection. We do all agree that Israelites might have thought of Jesus as their Messiah, who would deliver them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. Like Korean people thought of General MacArthur as their Messiah. 
Was John the Baptist waiting for this kind of Messiah? Is that the reason why he had to ask, are you the one? Should we wait for another? Or did he ask like this just because he was put in jail and he lacked enough opportunities to observe class of Jesus activities? To John the Baptist's question, Jesus could have answered directly. Jesus could have answered simply, I am, or I am not. But Jesus didn't do so for John the Baptist. John the Baptist would have to decide for himself. That's right. Whether Jesus is the Messiah or not, we must decide for ourselves too. So Jesus tells John the Baptist disciples, Go, oh, tell John what you see and hear. And then Jesus continues to give John every evidence to confirm his belief. Matthew's Gospel informs us Jesus tells them what the important things are, what they can witness with their own eyes. And it is not an accident. What he tells them are the very things that the prophet Isaiah prophesied about Messiah. Isaiah said, On that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a scroll, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the neediest people shall exert in the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18 to 19. This morning, I'd like to introduce a heartwarming Christmas story I read from a magazine. There was a postal clerk in England who handled the mail to Santa Claus. The clerk was called the Mixi Clerk because he handled all the mail that was Mixi because of an insufficient, inaccurate, or illegible address. Here is a letter sent to a magazine editor by the Mixi Clerk. It reads, Last Christmas, the letters began to pile in, as usual, addressed to Santa Claus. I suppose I get hundreds of letters every year. On Christmas Eve, I was working late and was very sad and lonely in my corner. There was a great rush at the windows and the office and the malls were loaded with Christmas gifts and greetings. A merry crowd rushed through the corridors and left the sounding all around. But a great shadow of sorrow rested over me, and my eyes burned as I bent over my room. Finally, the, mess the messenger brought me the last few mixes of the day and laid them on my desk. I took up the first one mechanically. Attached to it was a note from postman number 34. This was given me by a little girl at 302 Morrow Street. 
my body tingled when I read it. Because that address was my own home. The envelope was a small one addressed to Santa Claus North Pole. The envelope was a small one. Oh, okay. I recognized my own little girl's cramped hand wine. This is what she wrote. Dear Santa Claus, we are very sad at home this year. And I don't want you to bring anything bring for me. Little Charlie, my brother, went up to heaven last year. And I, all I want you to do when you come to my house is to take his toys to him. I will leave them in the corner by the chimneys. His hobby horse and train and everything. He will be lost up in heaven without them. Especially his horse. He always enjoyed riding it so much. So you just take them to him and you need, need not mind leaving me anything. If you could give daddy something that would make him start crying all the time, it would be the best thing you could do for me. I heard him tell mommy that only eternity could cure him. Could you give him some of that? Be sure to take the thing to Charlie and I will be your good little girl, Mary. Yes, John the Baptist. And my grace, United Methodist sisters and brothers and friends. He is the Messiah. And we need not wait for another. All we have to do is to accept him and have him live in our hearts. Just as that postal clock's little girl, Marion, did. Thanks be to